Hello and welcome to Early Childhood Ireland's podcast, which features interviews and discussions on all issues relating to high quality in the early years and school age care sector. In our episodes, we have a range of speakers who are leaders in the areas that matter to Early Childhood Ireland members. This podcast series is proudly supported by Arrakis Insurance, which offers a comprehensive range of cover at discounted premiums for both business and personal insurance products. So visit www.aracus.ie for more information. In this series, we're exploring the Reggio Emilia philosophy, tying in with the exciting news about the National Pajama Day Reggio Emilia project. In an earlier series, we discussed the concept of the 100 languages of children, which is a key tenet of the Reggio Emilia philosophy. And in this series, we're exploring the philosophy in more detail. So if you heard in the first episode of this series, Melissa Atanaskovich spoke about how and why the approach was developed post-World War II. In episode two of the series, I chatted with Orla and Anne, some members of Early Childhood Ireland who were in Reggio Emilia before Christmas. And today we're going to tease out the idea of our image of the child in more detail. In that first episode with Milits, I quoted one of the founders of the Reggio Emilia approach, Laris Malaguzzi, as saying that the Reggio image of children is of a child that's rich in potential, strong, powerful, competent, and most of all, connected to adults and children. And Ashther also talks about the importance of relationships and of seeing children as confident and competent learners. Dr. Rita Emilia, my former colleague, completed her doctoral studies on how, as educators, our image of the child impacts how we support their learning and development. And I'm delighted that Rita can join us today to tell us more. Rita's worked in the sector for many years. She operated her own creche. She worked with Early Childhood Ireland for 16 years, and then she moved to the Tusla Early Years Inspectorate. In 2021, she moved to the Atlantic Technological University, formerly GMIT. And as I mentioned, she completed her PhD in 2020. During her studies, she was awarded an Irish Research Council scholarship and also a Fulbright scholarship to study at Harvard University in Boston. So, Rita, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks very much, Maura. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to teasing out some of these ideas around our image of children more. And I know that that was, um, you know, what your PhD research was all about. So can you take us briefly through um, what your uh, what your methodology did, what was what your approach was and kind of what some of your your findings were before we tease some of them out in in more detail? Absolutely, Maura. Well, the title of my PhD research is a bit long-winded, but it's my self-image and your interactions. The influence of the preschool educator's image of the child as a learner on children's well-being and involvement. So it was a mixed method ethnographic study and it was conducted in seven earlier settings. Two play-based settings in the West of Ireland, two Montessori-based settings in the West of Ireland, a play-based setting in Boston, Massachusetts, and two Reggio-inspired settings in Boston, Massachusetts, as part of my Fulbright scholarship to Harvard Graduate School of Education under the sponsorship of Howard Gardner. So the study itself explored how the educator's image of the child influenced their pedagogical approach and how that approach to teaching and learning subsequently impacts on children's levels of well-being and involvement. So the underpinning theoretical, the uh, theoretical underpinning for the study was uh, Ryan and DC 2000 self-determination theory. And they say that we all have three basic psychological needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Uh, Bronfenbrenner's biological, uh, bioecological theory, Ferry Laver's theories on wellbeing and involvement, and Bruner's models of mind and models of pedagogy. Um, during the, the methodology used, I undertook some um, questionnaires with parents, questionnaires with educators, semi-structured interviews with educators and parents. And then I I did some observation in each of the seven settings. So that was over a week in each setting. And I used the assessing for learning and development in early uh, years observation scales, reflect, respect, relate from the government of South Australia, Department of Education and Children's Services. So that was the methodology. And I suppose just to give a brief idea of the findings, because we'll discuss it more in the context of of this 
uh, podcast. The findings of the study suggest that children have higher levels of well-being and involvement when the approach to pedagogy is an autonomy supportive approach based on the image of a child that is competent and capable. So that's just a, a whistle stop tour of the, um, my study. Um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm very happy then to, to, to talk more about that, maybe the image of the child findings. So the, you know, one of the, the, the key bits you said there was the, the autonomy supported a, a approach. Um, you know, seeing children as autonomous is, you know, that's a very powerful image of a, of a child to have. How does that how does that influence how we work with, with children? I, I'd imagine some of that is even uh, subconscious or unconscious, is it? Well, absolutely. And I suppose um, Loris Malagusi says that your image of the child is where teaching begins. And he said we have an ethical and moral responsibility to uh, make explicit what our image of the child is. And Jerome Bruner would say that there is no pedagogical approach um, that isn't influenced by our image of the child. So in my study, um, I developed a framework uh, called Learning for Wellbeing, which looks at how the educator's image of the child uh, influences their pedagogical approach based on the theories, um, Bruner's theories, self-determination theory, um, and looking at, we'd say, how the educator sees the child. Now that image of the child that we have you know, there's this, our history as social, it has, it's influenced by a society, by culture, our, our beliefs and our values about children. So we have a lot of unconscious um, bias towards how we see children. Um, but if we see children as, and what my study found was that if we see children as a tabula rasa, as Brunner would talk about a tabula rasa, and he would say that, if we see children as empty vessels that need to be filled, as educators, we then think that we need to fill those vessels and that we think that we are the more powerful adult and that children will learn if they imitate us or if we provide information for them through didactic expo exposure, giving them the information or modeling, our children would learn by rote. And that approach, he would say, if you see the child as being this tabula rasa, he would say that that pedagogical approach is adult led. It's authoritative because the adult has more power. Uh, it's didactic, it's controlling, and it's transferring the knowledge from the adult to the child. The knowledge, uh, the, the adult being the holder of the knowledge as opposed to the child. And it sees the child then as a passive object of learning where, it's, where there is a transfer of knowledge over. Now, what this, the research will tell us is that if we have that kind of a pedagogical approach, children will have lower levels of well-being and involvement. And this would all tie up with the, the, the research from self-determination theory, because the motivation for their learning is extrinsic rather than intrinsic. So where children are giving, you know, given stars or, or rewards or punishment for, for knowing something, their motivation for learning is extrinsic. And they have what Carl Dweck will have is almost a fixed mindset. Now, this is the type of um, approach to teaching and learning, which is a traditional approach and a kind of, I suppose, um, an industrial model. Whereas if we see the child as competent and capable, as Malagusi tells us children are, we recognize that the child is a thinker. And Bruner has identified four models of learners, but the two models of learning that really, uh, you know, come in under this area is that the child is a thinker or is knowledgeable. So a thinker meaning that the child can think for themselves, learn by their mistakes, uh, that metacognition. Um, and if we think about them as being knowledgeable, we have to see the child not as a tabula rasa, but the child with funds of knowledge that's coming from a home that has so many rich experiences in life before they ever get to the earlier service. So if we see the child as competent, we see them as a thinker and knowledgeable. And then our pedagogical approach will be a lot more autonomy supportive. So where we offer opportunities for autonomy, competence and relatedness. Autonomy meaning that children have choice and voice and can make decisions 
uh, in relation to their play and their learning. The competence piece is really interesting, I think, because it's about recognizing that children need to be doing something that is important to them. Um, that it's not, um, it's not like sticking the cotton wool ball on the tail of the rabbit. It's about um, something that's meaningful for them. And then the relatedness is very much related to what Noreen Hayes speaks about is a nurturing pedagogy. The children feel safe and secure in their environment, that somebody has their back and that they are nurtured to and supported in their development. And when we have an environment like this, children are active participants and subjects of learning. And it's a, si a child-centered uh, approach using an emergent curriculum because you're listening to the voice of the child. In this kind of environment, children will have high levels of well-being and involvement. And this was really shown out in my own research. They're intrinsically motivated to learn and they have a growth mindset. And this feeds into what we all want at a policy level, but even for our own children and grandchildren, in my case, that children have opportunities to develop 21st century skills in critical thinking, collaboration, creativity and communication. So I suppose when we think about how does the image of the child um, impact pedagogy, I, I really believe from this framework that I've developed, which is completely based on the evidence that I have uh, collated during my own study, that your image of the child is where teaching begins, but we need to see the child as competent. So it's about where do we shift and how can we move to that space if we're not there already? And it's easy for me to say, that we see the child as competent. And I've said this to other people. I've seen my one of my grandchildren and I went out into the garden and he was up. I couldn't see him. And then he said, I'm up here, Nana. And he was up as far up in the tree as I could see. And I thought, oh my God. And I, I said, would you like to come down? And he said, Nana, would you like to get a photograph of me? And I said, okay, hold on and I get my camera. So I suppose, you know, Sometimes we have to let go and it's really about trusting the child. Yeah, I was just going to say that it is it's it, it's always about you know that that trusting the child. I remember actually at a an outdoor seminar a couple of years ago, you know, that it, because sometimes this can come to come to the fore outside first, maybe before inside, because children are engaging in more kind of challenging opportunities and so on. And I think it was um, Meg Coogan said about um, that they had to kind of think of themselves as having concrete in the wellies um, to kind of slow them from reacting to when a child, um, you know, did something that could be um, perceived as um, as a risk or, you know, and that that's how very slowly you kind of count to 10 you delay your reaction, you try to think, well, the child got up there, he wouldn't have got up there unless he was competent to get up there and I can trust that he can get down and uh, biting your lip on the be careful line. But it's that bit, isn't it, about developing trust? It is, but it's all, it's very hard for us sometimes to stand back because we are just, we want to care and we want to make sure children are safe and I suppose particularly when you're in an earlier service uh, you have that whole th piece that we need to make sure that they're safe and mm. nothing happens to them you know um, so it might be a little bit easier uh, with your own you know yes. um, yeah. uh, but at the same time I think that you, you really made a really good point there uh, Maura in relation to the standing back and that's what you will very much see in the Red Jones part um, settings and the educators standing back and trusting children. And I suppose the standing back and observing too, because, you know, when you were talking about the blank slate, the tabula rasa kind of idea, you know, I remember reading somewhere about, you know, just because I've taught something doesn't mean it's been learned. And that mm -hmm. when, you know, you again stand back and kind of think about, well, you know, I taught the children X, Y or Z, but is there evidence that 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 they have learned that? Um, and, and just because you've ticked the box to say that you've done X, Y or Z about whatever, it doesn't mean that the children have learned it or have absorbed it in the way that, um, 
you think it has because so much comes from like you said the funds of knowledge and you know what the children are um are coming from home with what they see happening at home what their experience is and what you know what our experience is as a as a child as a learner as well and for a lot of us of a certain generation we you know we're subjects of that kind of blank slate empty vessel kind of um teaching but I often say I was taught lots of maths in school but uh, there's very little still in the head today <laughs> you, you know and yeah, Carla Rinaldi has a lovely saying it's not what happened it's what's happening so it's not what that you had a maths class it's actually what went on in your head while that maths class was happening or what 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 formal what kind of how were you formulating your thinking yeah fair share you? of tuning out in my case I'd imagine <laughs> So um, how does, you know, you kind of touched on it there a, a little bit. Have you more to say about how the Reggio Emilia approach can support us as educators to see children as, as capable? You know, you, you were saying about your, your grandson being more interested in the photo of him being up the, the tree and the kind of having to, having to trust. You know, have you more to say about how we can develop um, yes, I suppose really, like based on the premise in Reggio that the, the image of the child is where teaching begins. So everything starts with the image of the child, that the child rich in potential, strong, powerful, competent, and most of all connected to adults and other children. So if we were to think about how that looks like in practice, the Reggio environments have, you know, autonomy, supportive learning environments, where the environment is seen as the third teacher so a rich environment for, for children to explore, to think, to make meaning, to really think critically, to collaborate on projects. And, you know, people talk a lot about the projects in Reggio, but the amount of collaboration that happens between children, educators, communities. Um, and then you think about looking at children's hundred languages. Children have lots of opportunities to be creative. And these are the kind of things. Reggio is a philosophy that can happen in Reggio. But you can be inspired by that approach in your setting. And certainly, I think, um, due to more knowledge, more research and more experiences and exposure to what, what happens in other countries or in, uh, you know, in other kind of approaches, I, certainly um, our own approaches here bring in a lot of this uh, radio. Like in, in SHIELD, the, the, first, the, the rights of the child, Everything starts with children recognizing that children have rights, uh, not just needs, that they have rights to beautiful environments, aesthetically pleasing environments. They have rights to be creative, to explore, to think, to have a voice. So these are all of the things that are underpinned in the Reggio approach. A big, a big emphasis on the in the Reggio approach is the relationship and the partnership between the, the parents and families and and the community, and that children are not just pushed into an earlier service and the door is closed and they stay there till they come out in the evening. Children are part of the community, valued members of the community, and they're seen and their voices are being heard in the community. And then when they're in their earlier settings, the relationship between the adult and the child, is that based on mutual respect, re um, reciprocal learning, co-researching, as opposed to an, uh, an authoritative approach or a teaching down approach. So this autonomy supported learning environment where the, the teacher, the educator and the child co-research together and, um, and children are active participants in their learning. They're embedded in the community um, and they have voice and choice and, and their basic psychological needs are met for autonomy, competence and relatedness. The autonomy, having the voice, the, cho the choice, the um, co uh, competence that what they're doing is meaningful. And if you look at any of the projects that they do in Reggio, they are so meaningful because they completely involve the child, child in the research project. The, the, ch the, the research is child led and the relatedness that, you know, that they it's based on a mutual respect. So these are the kind of things that what that we need to have in our earlier setting. So it's not the recipe for Coke. It's actually, it's basically that we can um, 
be influenced by this because we know what is important is that if children have these kind of rich environments where the, the educator is a partner in the learning, a co-researcher, they will have high levels of well-being. And if they have high levels of well-being, they will have high levels of involvement in their learning and meaning making processes. You know, and um, Laura, our um, fairy lavers will tell us if we want to know what it feels like to be a child in an earlier setting, we need to assess their levels of well-being and involvement. These are, if we're thinking about quality and we're thinking about structure quality, process quality, outcome quality is the outcome for the child, and that is high levels of well-being and involvement. And that happens in an autonomy supportive learning environment. And that's what I found in my research, that the regional inspired settings were very autonomous and supportive in their learning environment. And that the, the you know the well-being is 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 key. You you really won't have the involvement without the the, the well-being. Absolutely. Any of us are the same. It, yeah. You know, it, it carries on, carries on through life. So, you know, one of the key things that, uh, you know, that comes to mind, you know, yes, there's the environment and the, the philosophy and the image of the child, but the creativity and in the other conversations that, that we've had, that the, the creativity, the, the access, the opportunities that children have to explore all kinds of media and all kinds of creative ways. How, can you can you take us through why that's such um, an important aspect of um, why it supports children as capable learners, how it supports the development of the potential that children have, you know, why it's creativity among, you know, of, of all other things that seems to um, support the, the strong potential of the child? Yeah, more, I suppose. And Mal Loris Malaguzzi was such um, a leader in his field. And he insisted when he set up the uh, infant toddlers and centres and preschools in Reggio Emilia that each centre would have an artist working with the children. So they have, you know, and they had grown to, to have um, psychologists and, but an artist in every centre and they had an atelierista or an art room for, for you know, for exploration of all of the different arts and when I think of creativity I think of the hundred languages of children um, and I also think of Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence creating opportunities for children to express themselves through creative arts dance music theater visual arts um, in, in an, uh, an autonomy supportive learning environment really supports children's well-being and when we talk about um, the creative arts and, and creativity. Um, this offers children opportunities to be autonom uh, autonomous, to choose, to think, to, to make meaning, um, um, uh, to, um, to be competent in, their, in what they're doing and, and find what their, um, you know, what their niche area is, what their area of interest is, what their passion is. So children all have different passions. And it's about finding that passion for each child and supporting that, um, to, for, uh, let, supporting children to engage in, in the arts. And I think the educator has a huge responsibility in this, in this regard. Because when you think about the hundred languages of children, you think about the poem, hundred ways of being, of listening, of marveling. But then you think about what the educator can do to that child. The educator can come and say, think without head, do without hands, marvel only at Christmas and at Easter. So the educator's role can take that all away from a child if they're not reflective and thinking about, critically thinking about what it is they're doing. So um, that's why I suppose really we have to come back to what Malagusi says, your image of the child is where te teaching begins and also nothing without joy. And that's a great point to, uh, to end on. Um, uh, nothing without joy. It's a, you know, it really is wonderful when you're in a setting to see children engaged, involved, high levels of, of well-being, um, exploring and thinking with, with, supportive educators it, it it really is joyful so Rita thanks for ending on on that uh, uplifting note and thank you very much Maura
And thanks for, for coming on to chat to us. And thank you for listening to this episode of Early Childhood Ireland's podcast, which is proudly supported by Aricus Insurance. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and spread the word to your friends and colleagues and stay tuned for our next episode. Mm-hmm.